This lecture presentation is on simple linear regression. I'm Pat Obi, Professor of Finance and Quantitative Methods at the Purdue University campus in Hammond, Indiana. In this introductory presentation, we're going to focus on the theory and concepts of reg regression analysis. And at the outset, we pose the question, what is linear regression, which actually is a field of applied statistics called econometrics. And as I note here, it deals with the relationship between variables. So the key word here is relationship. And in the case of a simple linear regression, it deals with the relationship between two variables. And we're going to call those x and y, where y is the dependent variable in that relationship and therefore is the variable whose behavior we wish to model. For example, you may be interested in modeling the fuel efficiency of cars. Um, you could also be interested, as I show some examples here, um, in looking at corporate performance, student performance, the financial risk of firms, personal income of uh, citizens of a certain country, life expectancy of uh, babies born in a certain community, health and wellness of uh, individuals in a particular city. And X, on the other hand, is the variable we believe might help us explain the behavior of Y. So and therefore, X is the independent variable. It is, in this context, the explanatory variable. So in the case of fuel efficiency of cars, the explanatory variable here might be the size you know, the weight of automobiles. So I show some uh, examples here where uh, the weight of uh, the vehicle would serve as the explanatory variable for fuel efficiency. For corporate performance, you might consider advertising expenses because you probably believe that the more money you spend advertising the uh, firm's uh, services and products, the uh, greater would be the demand and therefore the firm's performance would uh, improve. Uh, for student performance, you might believe that hours of study per week might help you explain why some students do poorly and others do very well. Uh, for financial risk exposure, you might believe that interest rates uh, might help explain that because as interest rates rise, the cost of raising capital to finance uh, business investments uh, becomes quite expensive and uh, that would also make it increasingly uh, difficult for the firm to uh, pay back debt, which as you know is a financial obligation. Education perhaps can be a good explanatory variable for income. The more education you have, the more likely, to, uh, more likely your income is to rise. But something I, um, I, I also listed here is to create a consciousness that in a regression, one thing is to identify the problem that you wish to attack, which is your dependent variable. But yet another is to uh, make sure you can measure it. If you say, well, I want to deal with fuel efficiency of cars, I want to look at that. The question is, how do you intend to measure fuel efficiency? An example perhaps could be miles per gallon. The uh, lower uh, the, the miles per gallon, the more efficient perhaps you could conclude the vehicle to be. For corporate performance, perhaps the top line of the income statement revenue, or perhaps the bottom line, or perhaps other um, fundamentals such as earnings per share, return on equity, uh, net profit margin, etc. Student performance perhaps could be SAT, GPA, some test score. Um, the financial risk measure could be the firm's debt ratio. The higher, higher your debt ratio, the um, more you're leveraged. Um, income could be salary, monthly salaries. It could also be hourly wage rates. Anyhow, so I just threw these out to give you a sense as to the fact that after you've identified the problem you wish to attack, then you want to be sure that you can measure it in some way um, before you continue. So now, let's say you've settled on examining the fuel efficiency of cars and you've uh, pursued to that, you went ahead and obtained a sample of eight vehicles. And for each vehicle, you record the uh, weight uh, in hundreds of pounds. Uh, correspondingly, you also identify the miles per gallon, uh, the freeway miles per gallon right here. So for vehicle number one, you find that it weighs 2,100 pounds and gives you 35 miles to the gallon. 
for vehicle number eight, you, which weighs 2,600 pounds, you find that it gives you 28 miles to the gallon and so forth. So now you begin by plotting a scatter plot, uh, which is also called a scattergram, to kind of get a sense as to the flush between mileage, your dependent variable, and um, the weight of the vehicle. So it looks something like this. And actually, I did this on, on spreadsheets, and this is it. So all you have to do is highlight these two columns right here. You don't want to have more than one row of uh, label. And then simply go to Insert and choose Scatter right there. The first one there is good, and there you have it. And then you can put on the bells and whistles, you know, the x-axis label as well as the y-axis label. And so um, this is your finished product. And now you're beginning to see that there seems to be a negative flush in that the heavier the vehicle, the less gas efficient it is. As you can see right here, heavier vehicles come up with, um, are associated with uh, lower gas mileage. Lighter vehicles have higher gas mileage. But this is what's called casual empiricism. More rigorously, in regression analysis, we are going to specify um, a regression model, as you see here, which some of you may recognize this as the equation of a straight line, which in fact it is. It shows you here that the dependent variable y is a function of the independent variable x on the right side of the equation. And the strength and nature of this relationship is defined by its parameters. The parameters include the y-intercept, beta sub 0, right here, Right? And more importantly, the slope of the line, beta sub 1. Beta sub 1 is the most important element in this argument because it's going to tell us by how much y relies on x. Now, within the mix of this relationship, we also have this random error term here, this epsilon term here. What it does is it captures, as I note here, the unexplained variations in y because there are some times your dependent variable may move around um, without uh, having anything to do with changes in your x and your explanatory variable. So we would hope, as we proceed with this inquiry, that the impact that this epsilon term would have on y would not amount to a hill of beans or as we say in econometrics, will be identically and independently distributed about the mean of zero. So now, in that relationship, we therefore break it down into two parts. We have the non-random part, and we have the random component. The non-random part is also referred to as the systematic component of the regression model. And so we find that in this relationship, we, we are seeking to find the expected value of y, which we can represent in this manner. In other words, we're trying to answer the question, what would y be, its expected value, if x takes on a certain value? As you can see, the answer to that question would rely on b1, which is our focus in this relationship, this parameter, B1, is the key ingredient, is the key outcome we seek to um, identify. Because as you can see, as the independent variable x increases, y will increase if, on average, beta sub 0, sorry, beta 1, is positive. So if this guy here is positive, it tells us that if x goes up, y would go up. If x goes up, y would go up. If, on the other hand, it's negative, then it's telling us as x increases, y would decrease on average. Or if x decreases, then y would increase. So they're moving contrary directions. And the value that b1 would take will give us a sense as to by how much y would change per unit change in x. And again, if you're familiar with calculus, you would call that your first derivative. So the question, therefore, becomes how do we estimate b0 and b1? Answer, it's called the method of least squares, also called the ordinary least squares method. Now, but keep in mind that in empirical studies, we're going to be left to use sample data so that 
um, we are not able to observe the population parameters B0 and B1. In lieu of those, uh, we're going to observe the estimators. So little b0 would be our estimator for beta sub 0. And little b1 is going to be our estimator for beta sub 1, the slope of the line. So how then does the method of least squares calculate these uh, parameter estimates? And now keep in mind that this is our regression model. What the OLS method is going to try and do is to minimize the influence of this bad boy here. It's going to try to minimize its influence on Y so as to be able to fully isolate the systematic aspects of this relationship. In all other words, to isolate the impact that X has on Y. So it's going to try and dampen this guy right here. But it does so by minimizing the squared errors so that in the end what we're going to wind up having would be the least the best linear unbiased estimates uh, for beta sub 0 and beta sub 1 and when that happens we call the regression line that would have been obtained in the process the line of best fits to show this in practical terms at least um, this is our regression, our estimated regression model based on sample data. And this is the error term right here. So this is the error term whose influence you seek to minimize. So what is it? Let's solve for it algebraically. And that's it right here, which is simplified in this form. So this statement here is our error term. It's y, the dependent variable, minus the intercept, minus the slope multiply by multiplied by x. So now, what is the sum of the squared error? Again, this is our error. Square it, all right, as I show here. Then sum it, as I show here, all right? It seems pretty um, simple, and actually it is. This is the sum of the squared error. So now, to minimize it, we're going to do, we're going to differentiate this error equation, as you can see here, with respect to each of the estimators, B0 and B1. So in the case of B0, we differentiate this, um, this equation here, this function here, with respect to B0, set it equal to 0, and then solve for B0, and do the same for B1. Now, this process in calculus is optimization, actually. It's a process of finding the mean or the max of, of a function. Now, there's an alternative way, too, that you can do this. There may be a couple other ways. And this other alternative way is to normalize the equation, to normalize this regression equation. Normalizing the equation means first, sum across the left and the right side of the arguments, and then multiply each side of the arguments by the independent variable x. And then you're going to have a set of matrices matrices I should say and then you solve for B0 and B1 now we're gonna leave uh, the uh, that rigorous uh, uh, fairly complex process to a different presentation so the most important aspect of this is to show you the final product the slope of the line B1 and the intercepts of the line so this is actually what we seek so this tells us that the slope of the line B1 is equal to the sample size in the numerator, the sample size multiplied by the sum of the products of x and y values. And then we're going to subtract the sum of the values of x, which is multiplied by the sum of the values of y. And, in, and downstairs here in the denominator, we're going to take the sample size and multiply that by the sum of the squared values of x. So we're going to square the values of x first and then sum them up and multiply it by the sample size. And then we're going to subtract. You see here, this is sum of x. After you get the sum of x, then you square it. So now, for the, for the intercept, b sub 0, we're going to get the mean of y, the sample mean of y, y bar, and then subtract b1 and then multi multiplied by the sample mean of x. So as you can see, to get the y-intercept b0, we actually first need to get b1. So after we get b1, we plug it in here, multiply it by the sample mean of x, and subtract it from the sample mean of y. 
All right, we're going to deal with those coming up shortly. But first, uh, the method of least squares is based on fulfilling a certain set of assumptions, the first of which is that the relationship between x and y is linear. The second is that the values of x uh, have to be fixed. In other words, they cannot be uh, random. Now, this condition is called non-stochastic. The third, and perhaps most important, is that the error term is normally distributed with a mean of zero and constant variance. And this is mathematically represented in this way. See, the error term distributed normal with a mean of zero, the first arguments within the parenthesis, and constant variance. A mean of zero means it doesn't really amount to much. It doesn't amount to a hill of beans, as I said earlier. Constant variance is a condition in regression analysis called homoscedasticity, meaning the variability of the error term stays the same regardless of the values of x within the regression. Number four is that successive error terms are uncorrelated with each other so that we don't have any information flow from one error term to the other because if there is information flow then we cannot say that they are random. And finally the error term is uncorrelated with the values of x so that we do not have errors in uh, the independent variables. So finally what do we use regression model for? Three key goals can be achieved in this process. The first is we can use the model as a prediction model to find what the value of y would be given the value of x going forward. Two is as a control uh, mechanism. For example, if you believe that um, uh, that fuel efficiency is a function of the weight of vehicles, you can control um, you can control uh, the fuel efficiency of cars. You can set that fuel efficiency to a certain level by controlling the weight of cars. And finally, it enables us to understand the nature of the relationship between y and x. Because if you look at b1, the value of b1, if it is positive, we know that x and y have a positive relationship. If it's negative, we know that they move in contrary directions. So at the minimum, it can help us answer the question, how is, for example, fuel efficiency related to the weight of cars? Is it really true that heavier vehicles have less fuel efficiency? Is it really true that firms that advertise less um, perform poorly, more poorly, that kind of a thing. So this is the opening salvo and going forward now we're going to show some basic examples of how to calculate the values of B0 and more importantly B1.